But 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. If you will listen, for this is God's word to us. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your souls. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we gather before you now. Um, I think that this word, uh, which, God, you had planned that we would be hearing from this, uh, God, many weeks ago, uh, God, but you knew that we needed to hear it this week. And so we pray you would speak through it to us when you work to transform us by your Holy Spirit. I ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, One of the most famous passages in the entire Bible, and I think one of the most important ones, is the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthews chapter 5 through 11. And I think it stands out for several reasons. Uh, The first is that uh, if you start reading the New Testament, you you start on the page 1 in Matthew, and you start reading... uh, Jesus, we know this is a book about him, but the adult Jesus doesn't come on the scene until the end of chapter 3, and he doesn't start teaching anything at length until Matthew 5, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So it's the first extended block of teaching about G- from Jesus to us. However, it's also simo- important for us because it is parallel to another important event in Israel's history. Uh, Last week we read from Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 6, whenever Israel had been delivered from Egypt and they came to Mount Sinai, and it was there at Sinai that God gave them the law. Moses went up on the mountain and received the law from God, and so you had God giving his law to humans. It was a new charter for this new nation, this new people. Well, in Matthew 5, verse Uh, chapters 5 through 7, Jesus is the Son of God, and he comes and stands again on a mountain and speaks not only as God to man, but he speaks as God and man, and he gives them a new law, a new charter for a new people of God that will be established by the new covenant in his blood. So I think it is significant for us for several reasons. Uh, We could spend a whole sermon series just on that, but I need to move on today. So if you start the Sermon on the Mount, it starts off with this text called the Beatitudes, Blessed is the one who does this. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And after Jesus kind of gets that settled, then he starts off saying this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. He tells this new people, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put a basket on it, put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine among others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He compares his people to salt and light. Salt is a substance that has a preserving quality, it has a purifying quality, but it also gives taste to things, right? If uh, some of you have, from time to time, had to go on a no-sodium diet or a no-salt diet, and you know you eat that food and it is bland, it has no taste at all. But the more salt you add, the more flavor it gets. And if you read Jewish wisdom literature, it actually compares our wisdom that we sprinkle into the world to salt. And so whenever we are engaging with the world, we are seasoning the world, we're imbuing it with the glory of God. But the metaphor that I actually want to spend more time focusing on today is that second one, that you are the light 
of the world. Light is meant to be seen. Right? You don't light, you know, darkness, if you think about it, has no substance at all, right? If, uh, if, if there is darkness and you turn on a light, that darkness goes away, right? And so we are to be a light to the world, for the world. And so he doesn't, this, this is, I think, so critical, again, that this is Jesus' first teaching to his people, and he's telling them how they relate to the world. And he says that you're not simply to be a pure enclave that withdraws from everyone and pulls back. No, you are to live in the world. You're to give light to it, right? Don't put a bushel around yourselves. Don't herd yourself away from everyone else. You need to live in the world. Um, I say this because last week, it's important, Peter spoke to us about how we are the people of God in exile. And he's talked about our identity as the new covenant people of God. And as he writes to Christians who are in exile, who are in a less favorable condition publicly, there's there's a temptation to just pull back. Uh, And what's interesting is there actually were people who did this before Jesus came. There were a group of Jews called the Essenes. Uh, You may have never heard of them, but you've heard of the Pharisees, right? You've heard of the Sadducees. If you've read through the Gospels, those are probably some familiar groups. But there was a group called the Essenes, uh, and you might have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, This is the community that produced those. But the reason you probably haven't heard of them is because they thought in order to be faithful Jews to God, they had to totally withdraw from the world. They didn't live in Jerusalem. They didn't live in Judea. They went and lived in a solitary commune by the Dead Sea. They meditated upon scripture there. They tried to be faithful there, but they didn't engage with the world at all. And hence, you have never heard about them. (laughs) Jesus does not call us to withdraw, but rather he calls us to engage. Peter knew that. And so uh, he was there, right? He was standing at the mountain whenever Jesus preached these words, and then he happened to travel around with Jesus for three years. He was a witness to the death and resurrection of Jesus and his ascension. And so as I think Peter, what he's trying to do is he has established their identity as the people. He now wants to give them a method to show them the ways and the means in which they are to engage with the world. And he tells them this. I think this is the thrust of our passage today. That rooted in our hope and faith in Christ, God's people are to live holy lives that are engaged in society, bearing witness to Jesus in every realm before the watching world. Let me say that one more time. Rooted in our faith and hope in Christ, God's people are to live holy lives that are engaged in society, bearing witness to Jesus in every, every realm before the watching world. Well, the first thing, I mean, this is about as plainly as you can say it. He says, as God's people, you need to live godly lives. As God's people, you need to live godly lives. Uh, He starts off verse 11 with one word, and I want to focus on that for just a second. He calls the church beloved. Beloved. And I don't think it's simply saying that this is the affection that Peter feels for the congregation. I think it's actually a reflection of the way in which God feels about the congregation. You are loved from God. And it's actually a marker that he'll use in here in 2.11 and again in chapter 4, verse 12, to indicate that this is a new section of the letter. We could say he's getting into the body of the letter here. But they are the beloved. It's what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community. We are loved by God, and thus we love one another and the world. And so the first way that he encourages the beloved to guard, uh, to to live godly lives, is by first guarding against fleshly passions. To guard against fleshly passions. He says in verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, as strangers and resident aliens, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which, which, which rage war against the soul. Throughout the Bible, we're warned against our passions, or maybe your Bible translation says there, your fleshly lusts. And here, whenever Peter talks about lust, he's not simply talking about sexual lust, although that would be included. He's talking about the desires that we have. We all desire good things. What happens is whenever our desires run amok, whenever we let them dictate our lives, that's whenever we often walk out of God's will. Okay, whenever you and I feel things, it's not a bad thing, but whenever the desire is unrestrained, unimpeded, it can become very dangerous. And again, this relates to sex, right? The temptation uh, to sex uh, and sexual sin is just as strong 2,000 years ago as it is today. And so 
that certainly is within the purview here, but also food. Right? I have a desire for food. I like to eat good food, and so I spend a lot of money and a lot of energy consuming more than I really need. I can become a glutton. Right? It could be that desire you have to be in the know or to make other people in the know. So you've got that juicy piece of gossip. Right? There's a desire you have to share that and maybe leverage some power over somebody else. Or maybe you have a desire to be competitive. Right? It's the passion that is flowing inside of you. But you don't just want to win every game that you play, whether that's a board game or a football game. You want to win against every opponent in every arena. So and it's a zero-sum game every single time. And your unrestrained competitiveness, which can be a good thing at times, ends up hurting other people. These are all fleshly passions. But I want to talk for just a second about, I mentioned that sex is not the only one, but I do want to focus on that as an example, as an archetype, perhaps, of these others. Uh, again, it is, a, it is a perpetual idol. I, I remember walking a couple years ago, Samantha and I were in, in New York City uh, for just a brief period of time, and we were walking down Madison Avenue, which is the, it's the street that has all the high-end shops, all the high-end stuff. You walk there, people's clothes are nicer, they look prettier. They, uh, they've got all the trappings of the world. And we were walking past the window display for one of the prominent, uh, prominent uh, fashion designers. And they had the three cries of the French Revolution there. Right? Those were liberty, equality, fraternity. Right? We want freedom, we want to be equal, and we want to have fraternity with one another. But they had actually substituted that third one. It wasn't liberty, equality, fraternity. It was liberty, Equality, sexuality, right? Elevating that as one of the key human passions, one of the key human forces that we need to honor, we need to let be unrestrained, have no, const um, have no constraints at all. The world tells us within re this regard, you do you, okay? Don't let any person, don't let any group confine you. You need to live and to be fully who you are. And the problem is that just doesn't accord with what the Bible teaches, right? If we... That's the exact opposite of what the Bible commends us to live. Right? The, the lie is that you must live to fulfill all of your sexual desires. But this is contrary to the biblical witness that God has designed sex to be between one man and one woman in a monogamous covenantal marriage for life. And of course, we know that sin affects this. However, uh, one of the main idols in our society today is that this should be one way in which you live unrestrained from anything, even what God would say about this. While we do have a freedom in Christ, we are not free to live for licentiousness. That's what he says down in verse 16. We should live as people who are free, not using our freedom to cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. And he says that if we allow our passions to be unrestrained, then they're actually waging war against our soul. And again, that, that's not just the inner part of us. It's our entire selves. If we allow ourselves to live totally unchecked, totally without regard to God's will, we're waging war against who we are, who God has made us to be in Christ. And so we have to live honorably before... We have to guard ourselves against fleshly passions, but we also need to live honorably before the world. I would point you to verse 12 now. Peter says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, that is, people who are not believers. Again, it's a technical term that means non-Jews, but here he's using it for any person who doesn't believe. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Again, this is the parallel to the fact that you are the light of the world, so let your light shine among men so that they may glorify your Father in heaven. He literally says, whenever they call you evildoers, they should see, this is in the Greek, when they call you evildoers, they should see that you are actually good doers. Right? And this is a form, as we live holy and honorable lives before God and before the world, we don't do it in a self-righteous, haughty manner, that I am better than you, but rather it's a form of lifestyle evangelism. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean that we live and we don't ever have to proclaim the gospel. There's a famous saying, sometimes it's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, and it says, preach the gospel when necessary, use words. And, I mean, that sounds good. It, it, the intention, I think, is good. But we have to reckon with the fact that the gospel is a proclamation. It is a message about Jesus that we have to share. However, our lives must be in accordance with it. And whenever we live holy lives, whenever we live with integrity and honor, it bears witness to the integrity and honor that Jesus has. 
Right? It lays the groundwork for our Christian witness in the world. If we are loving our neighbors, if we're abstaining from sin, uh, this goes a long way. I heard a testimony from a pastor this, this past week who uh, he was in a, he came to Christ as an adult. And before he was a Christian, he was a barber. And he said, you know, when I was a barber, I really only liked to hire Christians because I knew they wouldn't steal or lie to me. And eventually this man came to faith as a result of uh, the witness and the actions of those who he worked with. So our good deeds can dispel the lies that we're bad people. And again, our light can shine among men. But I do want us to think about the flip side of this coin. It's not a comfortable thing to look at, but I think we, ha- we must. What happens if we as Christians, or perhaps others who go by the name of Christian, do wrongdoing. If our good actions defend us from accusations of wrongdoing, what about the bad actions that we do? Uh, They can... uh, This is... One word for this is hypocrisy, and I would say hypocrisy does about as much for the church as... Uh, you know, a child playing with matches does um, for the fire department. We have to address this because there are sins that Christians commit daily. I know that. I'm not saying that we are sinless perfectionists. However, there are scandals that happen at churches that you never hear about. And there are also big ones, the bright lights who go out in a ball of flame. In 2019, the Houston Chronicle, February of 2019, two years ago this past week, The Houston Chronicle reported stories of over 700 victims of sexual abuse in SBC churches, and this abuse was perpetrated by staff and volunteers. Uh, Sometimes these people who perpetrated the offense would go from one church to another. You know, they might get fired at their church, but it wasn't reported. They didn't go to the police. They'd go to another church, and they'd continue their spree of evil. The details were absolutely horrific. And so the... Light was shown on this, and you had some people, sometimes leaders of churches, sometimes public figures in the denomination who were saying, this is a distraction from the Great Commission. Why do we need to deal with this? Brothers and sisters, if we can't deal with this, then we don't deserve to to serve on the Great Commission. You had critics from the outside who said, why aren't there more accountability structures? And you had people saying, well, that would violate church autonomy. We can't do that. That's a garbage answer. If you want to know why we have policies that mandate background checks for every person, regardless of how long they've been a member, regardless of how trusted they are, if you want to know why we really make our policies and procedures align for this, is because we never want this to happen here. And, and one reason that's important is because it's often those who are the most trustworthy who are given the license to do the worst things. Again, I don't want to keep harping on the negative, but this past week, There was a major report published about the late Christian apologist Robbie Zacharias. I don't know if you've heard his name before, but he was probably one of the most well-known Christian apologists in the world. He would travel the world debating people for the faith. He wrote over 20 books, and so many people say his books help me believe in the intellectual credibility of the Christian faith. If it wasn't for him, I would have been lost, and I would have left the faith many years ago. And in... uh, In 2018, he even addressed the entire gathering of the Southern Baptist Convention in Dallas. And he passed away this past May, in May in 2020, of cancer. And whenever he passed, the tributes were plentiful. But there was an underside, and it was an underside that was actually in plain sight. In 2017, and this is a year before he addressed the Southern Baptist Convention, a woman alleged that he had had inappropriate sexual relations with her. And so, you know, he said, this is a false accusation. The board does an investigation internally. They say, we think there's no substance to these claims. And then he was able to continue his ministry, right? After he passed away in May, then a few other women started coming forward that he had had inappropriate contact with them in massage parlors. And once the number got so much, the board couldn't not do anything more about it anymore. They had an inter- they had a, not an internal, they had a third-party investigation come in. And they just published it this past week. Over 200 women claimed that he had assaulted them. 200. Even in the months up right before his death, they found that he had been downloading pictures of women onto his computer. 
And whenever these women would come forward and say, if I'm going to tell someone, he would say, do you think they're going to trust you over me? The case is exceptionally, it's exceptionally evil, brothers and sisters. I would, I would not encourage you to go look for it. You can. I'm not saying you can't, but I'm just saying to spare your own soul. It is hard to read. And he's not the only name in recent months and in recent years who has gone out in a ball of flame. Carl Lentz, Jerry Falwell Jr., Bill Hybels, even some from within our own, our own SBC ranks, high-level denominational leaders and executives. And whenever internal staff tried to let people know, they were often fired or shown the door. Okay, I, I say their names because we need to know who committed this evil, but I won't do the dignity of repeating their names. And I just I want to bring this up, not because I want you to feel bad, but we have to reckon with this fact Whenever we think that our light is shining among men, but the world has seen so much evil and wickedness. Whenever they see people from Christian organizations and churches who have aided and abetted abusers and have covered things up, it puts an extra onus on our behavior today. Right? If someone who's already biased against Christianity, they have enough evidence already in their book for why they can close the book and say adios. So not only must we resolve internally to stand against this, we have to resolve to represent Jesus well from his word, right? If the world knows that, well, they serve a Jesus who's fine with abusers, right? Often what people do when one of these bright lights commits sin, what people are so eager to do is find a way to restore them and forgive them. And there's often no discussion at all about how we defend and protect the abused. We want to make it right for the abuser, but not for the one who had the offense committed against them. Right? We ignore the first red flag and we only respond after a dump truck of red flags has been dumped on our doorstep. We don't evangelize in a vacuum. And so we can't simply say, well, they weren't one of us. Right? I think that's an easy answer we want to say, but it's, not, it's, it's disingenuous. We have to acknowledge that this is a horror without excuse. We don't defend it at all. And we also have to demonstrate why our house is a house where this wouldn't take place. It's not because we're just good people. It's because we've taken steps to make sure that this would not be happen. We don't give anyone the freedom or the license as big as these people have had it so where they could go by without anything like this being brought to light. And then finally, it's only after we've done all those that our personal integrity will shine. Again, the onus is high. Whenever we live godly lives, we are buying back the reputation of Christianity from those who have besmirched it in the past. We must live with personal integrity, holiness, and love, and we must also build systems that are resilient against this type of abuse. Right? We can't let the swindlers and the vagabonds take the name of Christianity down with their indiscretions and their wickedness. But because the deck is stacked against us, we live, and again, we live in hope. Again, and I want us to remember that we serve a God who can do more than any of us could ever expect. Okay, it is the power of the gospel that saves. And as much as our lives pave the way for evangelism, it's not our lives that will save anybody, but rather it's the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we must continue to point them to Jesus while we build resilient structures and systems. As God's people, we must live godly lives. Well, so Peter says this, right, that as you live good lives, it's going to put to silence the criticisms of those who call you evildoers. And then he's going to go for the next two chapters and tell us different areas of our lives how this applies. And so the first area he talks about this in is with regard to our civic conduct. And he tells us basically be Christian in your civic conduct in the public realm. He says in verses 13 and 14, be subject for the Lord's sake, for Christ's sake, to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. I think that Peter's words are here are pretty clear for us, uh, but I think the difficulty here comes from bridging the gap between 56 AD or so whenever he wrote this and now 2021 AD, uh, 2,000 years later. And there's, there are some differences that we need to acknowledge. First off, uh, he wasn't writing to people who lived in a democracy, but rather under an empire, right? So there wasn't you didn't vote on who the Caesar was. The Caesar was who he was. Also, uh, he's writing to a place where the Christians are in the vast minority. And again, that's similar to other places around the world. It's not similar to where we are today. 
So that's another thing. He also was writing at a time before the empire had started a widespread persecution of Christians. If you read the book of Revelation, you know that the Apostle John had quite a different perspective on the emperor uh, after the emperor had started persecuting Christians. But regardless of the difficulties in bridging that gap, right, how do we, let's think about this, whenever the government doesn't reward those who do good but punishes them, and it doesn't punish those who do evil but it actually rewards them, then we have to do some tougher thinking about what's the right way to submit to the government. We, of course, never violate our conscience, um, but it does require uh, some thoughtful application. And it, I, I'll just say it does affect how we engage politically, right? I do think that Christians should be citizens distinct from the way in which the world uh, env envisions uh, corp or civic uh, citizenship. Uh, some, and sometimes when I mention politics, people kind of get stiff. They're like, is he, he's going to tell me that I need to be more liberal than I am, or perhaps he's going to tell me to be, vote more conservative than I do. And that's not what I'm here to do today. But I'm, what I'm here to say, and I think this is what Peter is trying to, to help us understand, it's not simply what we believe that's important. It's not simply what we say in the civic realm or how we vote, but it's actually the how that's very important. How do we engage in a Christian way civically? Right? Do we... Uh, stoop to the level of slander and of treating our enemy politically as if they truly are our enemy, right, rather than someone who we have a disagreement with? Do we share memes on Facebook or on social media that just says everyone who's on the other side of the political aisle for me is a moron and I can't believe just how ridiculous they are? No. As Christians, we need to speak with more dignity to one another. We need to see the image of God in every person. And even whenever people are being crazy, we don't respond in kind. Right? The Apostle Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians, and Peter himself will say this later in chapter 2, that whenever we are reviled, we bless. Okay? And so we must engage. We, we, we march to the beat of a different drum. And it's interesting if you read uh, things written about Christians from a little after this time. Uh, there are non-Christians writing about Christians, and they accuse Christians of being haters of mankind. Why? Because they engage differently in the civic realm. They don't participate in politics as normal. They don't offer sacrifices to the civic religion. But rather, they worship Christ as God, and that's their primary allegiance on earth. So they were literally called haters of humankind by those who disagreed with them. Well, I think that the second century church father named Tertullian, he wrote a thing called an apology, and he actually makes a great case for how we as Christians pray for those in power and I want to read a quote from him uh, right now. He says this. Whenever people are criticizing Christianity, he says this. Without ceasing, for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for their life prolonged, for security for the empire, for protection in the imperial house, for brave armies, for a faithful senate, a virtuous people, the world at rest, whatever as a man or Caesar an emperor would wish. These things I cannot ask from any but the God whom I know. I shall obtain them, both because he alone bestows them, and because I, as a Christian, I have claims upon him for their gift, as being a servant of his, rendering homage to him alone, persecuted for his doctrine, offering to him at his own requirement that costly and noble sacrifice of prayer, dispatched from the chaste body, an unstained soul, a sanctified spirit. I think that Tertullian had been meditating upon 1 Peter chapter 2. Right? But he's basically responding to people who want to level legal charges against Christians for acting inappropriately. And he says, listen, we pray for the emperor. And I think that my prayers are more important than yours because my God is the only God who can care for him. Right? I believe in the one true God. And I think it's helpful for us to see our citizenship in this way. And, and I really love the way that Peter concludes this in verse 17. He says, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. It's, it's interesting because Peter here was very cared about, he cares so much about the ordering of society with proper, but he says as we honor the emperor, we should also honor everyone. So you know the homage that you would show if the president or the queen of England were to show up to your doorstep and you know, be at your house for dinner? You should show that same level of honor and respect to every single person. Right? It kind of makes it, it kind of puts the emperor in perspective if we're supposed to honor everyone to the same degree. He says that we are to love the brotherhood, or that's another way of saying the family of faith. 
right? Honor the whole world, show dignity to every person, respect everyone, but love, have a certain love for the church. Fear God, right? So be subject to the government, be subject to the emperor, but don't fear him. Fear God, not because we're afraid of his judgment, but rather because we have a reverence and awe for him that we reserve for no other person. And we honor the emperor. Again, I think we do this every week in our prayers for our elected and appointed officials. I think this is not only something we do to look good before the world. That's actually not why we do it at all. It's something that we do because God has called us to do that. It's one way in which we honor them. The world is watching us. Right? Our neighbors have an eye on us, whether they're driving past the building, whether they're looking at us on Facebook. Right? They're keeping an eye on us at the supermarket and on the sideline. And so there are many ways in which we can bear witness to Jesus, and we should try to take advantage of all of them. We must. Again, if, if we don't come armed with what the Word of God says about Jesus of Nazareth, the world will never know who he truly was. Our proclaimed faith must be accompanied with a lived faith. Right? They're not going to care the Jesus who's on our lips if they can't see the Jesus who's in our life. So we live for the Lord. And remember this, that rooted in our hope and faith in Jesus Christ, God's people are to live holy lives that are engaged in society, bearing witness to Jesus in every, every realm before the watching world. As I finish today, I want to I want to say a word to everyone who's watching online or if you're watching here in person. Uh, I do want to issue a call to the gospel. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, I really believe that this is the most important decision that you could ever make. And so I would encourage you, if, if you're not sure of who Jesus is, to keep coming back, keep tuning in, keep showing up, because I want you to know Jesus. Okay. I want you to live a holy life as one who is also trusting Jesus for your salvation and forgiveness. But also, I want to say a word to the church today. Right? In light of what I mentioned earlier about other scandals, I just want to give us a charge as a congregation. I want us to be resolved 100% that our church will be a safe place for every single person who walks through the door. Every woman... Every baby, every child, every teenager, every man. All right, let us resolve to not give sin a free pass in our midst. All right, let us believe the testimony of those who are hurting and resolve not to allow abusers a free ride off the backs of our charity. And I want to say one final word today to those who perhaps have suffered abuse, perhaps recently or perhaps at some point in the past. Maybe you're old or maybe you are young. I want you to first to know that Jesus knows your suffering. God is not blind to the evil that has been perpetrated against you. I know that you are nursing wounds that nobody else can see. And I would encourage you, and I can't, I know everyone has to do this on their own timeline. I would encourage you, if you've never shared with that with somebody, to find someone who you trust and share with them. In particular, if the person who has committed abuse against you is still out there, and you still live in fear of that person, you should not have to live in fear any longer, ever. We want you to live in freedom, not fear. We want you to be whole, to be restored by the Lord. And so if you aren't sure what the first step is, we want to help you however we can. As we let our light shine among the world, let us be a place, brothers and sisters, where the weak can come, where the wounded can come, and be safe and know the Lord and be restored. If you would, please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Any light that we have, any uh, torches that we burn, Father, are only those that we have received from Jesus Christ. And Father, we know that there is a cloud of darkness that has settled over uh, us from time to time. God, whenever the bright lights go out, and even whenever those who, 
whose names we don't know commit sin. It ruins the faith. It ruins your reputation in the eyes of many. But you called us to shine our light to the world. You've called us to continue to bear witness to Jesus Christ. We don't place our faith in any human person or institution other than Jesus. And so I pray that you would help us to be faithful to him. God, we so desperately want to live holy lives. I'm aware that our war against the flesh and against sin is something that isn't solely that has a ramification on the world who sees us, but even internally, God, it wages war against our soul. We want to live confident, strong Christian lives. There are addictions which pick at us. There are sinful habits that creep up and, um, in our lives ones that we've tried to lay to rest and put in the grave many, many times. So God, I'm asking that you would empower us for holiness. We know your word says in 1 Peter 1, verse 1, that you've saved us for the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, for obedience to faith in Jesus Christ. So Father, I pray that you would send your Spirit to us, God, to strengthen us. God, would you help us to be a place, help us to have the the, the resolution to be a place that cares for those who have been abused. Father, sometimes it requires that we open up our eyes to a different set of circumstances, that we have to pay attention to things that we didn't know we needed to pay attention to in the past. But Father, I pray you would help us to take the steps necessary. God, we want to ask that you would act now for those who have been abused. God, your Bible, your word speaks of your justice and righteousness. It says that you heal the brokenhearted and you bind their wounds. And so, Father, we ask that this would be true today. It may be true of us. God, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.